there are many, many DSDs, and um, I, I really encourage all of you to uh, do some research in proper uh, areas uh, to better discuss DSDs. So I often like to say that uh, if you find something, you can only find it on the internet, usually it is not that good. And this is kind of a catch-22 in my mind, because um, on one side, I'm very appreciative of the fact that, um, thankfully, research uh, is much more easily um, understood or refuted, if that would be the case, because people have access to all research articles. And I'm thinking about places such as um, um, the NIH website, for instance, in the United States, or, or or portals such as Academia or ResearchGate, or even, although I don't particularly like it, Google Scholar, it's a good place to start, as long as you don't go on Wikipedia and you trust what Wikipedia says. Wikipedia is really a, a very, very poor um, scientific source. We can make the exception if you really scroll down and you see the original source, but even in that case, I would really you know, stay away from Wikipedia because it's more about popularization and far too often uh, misrepresentation of science. But in any case, you should study DSDs to see uh, their complexity and their um, and, the, and the way they uh, represent uh, variations in uh, human sexuality. Some example, probably the, the most common ones, the one that are quoted in science and in pop science, the most are probably Kleinfelter and Turner syndrome. So in the case of Kleinfelter, of course, we're talking about a 47XXY presentation. Uh, with which causes unfortunately uh, infertility and small testes and you know problems in puberty, and because we still have a Y gene, okay, um, in, sorry, in, in, at the level of uh, of uh, karyotype, we can still assume scientifically speaking that we're talking about a male individual. Okay, in general, this is a very important rule that in spite of all this variation and the variation are not are not statistically cumulative, okay? It's very important to make this distinction. I, I saw some scientists that um, I really value, and I was really surprised how, how, how they miss this very important point uh, in, in very basic mathematics. Uh, you cannot just, you know, uh, sum up DSD to come out with, with, with the current representation of the incidence ratio of, of, of DSD in the general population. It's just, it doesn't work like that because uh, th th that'd be somewhat similar to mix and match in mathematics the um, the median with the mean, for instance, right, or or, or the statistical average. You, you, you cannot do that in mathematics, and we'll talk later about the the, the prevalence of DSD. Uh, but in any case, uh, a general rule is that uh, in most cases, uh, DSDs should be considered medical problems or disorders. Because for two main reasons, one, due to their origin, that is a variation as in a mistake in the natural occurring process, okay, from chromosomes all the way to genitalia. And it also leads to a improper, unnatural result, which has to do with infertility. Let me clarify this. This does not mean, of course, that uh, we have to always consider ourselves, our identity, and our main purpose in life to be fertile in order to procreate. Everybody should be allowed to think, behave, act as they prefer. However, when we're thinking about biology and science, this is how the structure the structure's purpose has been constructed in the first place. And again, we're not making this assumption based on this or that philosophical, religious, or anti-religious perspective. We can observe that. So in all these cases, in the vast majority of uh, variation, if you find any variation containing a Y chromosome, you could assume that we're talking about a male subject. And in the absence of the Y chromosomes, we are talking about female subjects. Now, this has nothing to do with the SRY gene, which we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it later. But the point is that regardless of the variation, this variation, this uh, chromosomal spectrum still falls into the sex binary. So again, with Klein factor, we talked about 47XXY. The other one I mentioned was uh, Turner, I think I mentioned, Turner syndrome. And we're talking about 45X or um, 45X0. 
And because we don't have a Y, then we can assume that the person affected by Turner syndrome is indeed a female subject. What does it mean? Well, usually this is um, understood uh, or, or, or rather perceived before there is a um, consultation with the doctor as an absence of menstruation and uh, absence of phenotypical uh, norms such as breast, for instance. And of course, this also results in infertility. There are other issues uh, that uh, will be contained within DSD. Uh, one will be the 5-alpha-2 uh, reductance uh, deficiency, the, the, the enzyme, and, and, and uh, this is found in a 46XY presentation. And uh, this individual, keep in mind that Y, again, usually behave as men, as members of um, um, the, the, the masculine um, uh, subject group, and they and, and this and this issue is due to a mutation in in the uh, SRD five eight two gene. Other issues that are quite common in scientific literature is the um, malaria again from Mueller right um, a genesis uh, or even aplasia. Those those are um, uh, pretty um, pretty much um, synonyms. And th there is also a, a an acronym. It's, it's MR. MRKH, I think. Let me see if it's Meyer, Meyer Rokitansky Künstler Hauser. And again, af is affecting uh, female subjects. Another one that's very common is uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, 46XX. And of course, we should expect that to be a female subject. And because of the condition, the female subject will not only experience infertility, but also virilization or masculinization. Let's stop here for a second, because it's important to understand that this term should be interpreted according to a proper scientific understanding. Um, and what do we mean by virilization or masculinization? Let's take a step back here, something that we will discuss even further later on today. Uh, in terms of virilization and masculinization, we could say that those terms are, to a great extent, equivalent. Etymologically speaking, one has to do with the standard uh, Latin and even you know, pre-Latin, I mean, Indo-European, um, even Sanskrit, uh, masculum, right? Male, right? Masculinization. The other one, B-I-R, bir, virilization, in English is very often associated, associated with virility, but it's really connected to the male element itself. You could say even the archetype, not just in a Jungian perspective, but more in a etymological and I dare to say um, a philosophical perspective. And by philosophical, I could mean um, a um, perennial philosophy perspective. I don't usually like to mix, you know, esoteric knowledge with science, but to make uh, to make this point clear, beer is found in other um, etymological values in, in Latin. Think about um, uh, quercus robur, for instance, and uh, the, the value that the the tree is a representative of not just the 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 grammar gender, but the very archetype of masculinity. So, virilization in the context of congenital adrenal hyperplasia has to do with the phenotypical manifestation of the subject will be otherwise be uh, female into progressive more male features. Uh, there are a few more that we could discuss in this context. Um, another um, phenotyp male phenotypically presenting as female, uh, so an XY, 46XY, would be the complete androgen um, incessivity, incessivity uh, which is, again, a syndrome, just before, or the Swire syndrome, where uh, you find uh, another 46XY or 46XX affecting both, which is which, which is affecting the gonads, so it's a, a, a gonadal dysgenesis, and um, phenotypically presenting as feminine, as female, uh, but without properly functioning uh, gonads. Um, I think that there would be probably enough to make just a brief uh, summary. P perhaps we could also mention over testicular disorder. So XX with negative SRY gene that affects roughly speaking 55 to 80 percent of the subject, um, or, or rather, it's, it's, it's the 55 to 80 percent presentation. But you also have over testicular disorder in the in the keratinic presentation 
xx xy etc with uh, with five percent um uh, hermaphrodite uh, presentation so this is just a general uh, view of uh, these oral sex developments and i want to stress yet again the importance of uh, our understanding of disorders something that is beyond the order what other terms could you use in medicine well illness disease problem discomfort syndrome trait and many many others in all this situation there is an assumption the assumption which is entirely scientifically based and demonstrably so that there is an absolute truth and there are variations to the truth for instance in the context of illness at first an illness might be might sound less judgmental than a disorder but etymologically speaking when we think about illness we think about being ill which in itself as i mentioned elsewhere is connected to the old german übel it's connected to feeling nauseated feeling not at ease with oneself the assumption being that without the uh, comorbid effects of, of negative confounders you should feel at ease and it's an extremely important concept we are actually doing a disservice to our patients and at this point to our students to our general population to our children to pretend that disorders are not real and there are just a variation of the spectrum in a way to mistakenly understand what tolerance is we should actually discuss with a very clear and precise understanding of science the fact that there is a norm and any variation of the norm do not disprove the norm or do not make things better this has absolutely nothing to do with tolerance diversity and inclusion as I promised, I will not talk about myself and my own background, but um, people that know me within, I would say, academia and my fellow colleagues and scientists or, you know, um, the, the, the work I've done over the years in the context of modulating information we got from science into the public discourse know very well that I used to work and, uh, and I was a member for many, many years on multiple committees on diversity, inclusion, tolerance, education, even um, um, interfaith dialogue or dialogue across the believer, non-believer spectrum. And I still believe all the ethics that were uh, included in that, um, in that um, social assumption of uh, uh, diversity and inclusion. Now, of course, uh, the issue is that uh, people need to study a little more. Uh, and far too often, people mistake uh, um, egalitarianism with equality. And I will not venture into that etymological route today because I just want to stick to, to the topic. But the point I'm trying to make is we have to be careful in the way we use this term because if we use the wrong term, we are misrepresenting reality. So we talk about differences in sex development. So, so is this all about chromosomes, gonads, hormones, and genitalia? Of course not. Despite of the fact that in the absence of a proper function of all of the above, we will have problems. What about the brain? Well, we could say that the brain is the uh, central relay mechanism of the body. As I mentioned, I'm a little biased because that's my field, and so I, I have a special preference for the brain. Uh, but in any case, the brain is extremely sexually dimorphic. Any claim that will disprove that are simply anti-scientific at this point. In fact, more and more clear evidence is coming out every single year of the fact that the female brain and their male brain are indeed very, very different. What does that mean? This is one of the other situations where this or that political agenda might misrepresent what the science actually is saying. 
Diversity, it's not a diversity of hierarchy. I state it again. Diversity, it's not a diversity of hierarchy. To claim, based on solid scientific evidence, that males and female subjects are different does not mean that one group is better than the other. In fact, we can use the same analogy for the vast majority of things in life. We don't take for granted that if you have one thing and this thing is completely different from the other thing, this means that one thing is necessarily better or worse than the other thing. Not even in the case of the clear binary presentation of uh, neural function. This is another area where it's impossible to sum up in a few minutes the complexity of each category of brain function. But just for the sake of uh, starting a conversation, if you are interested, because it's really important to, to know how to start a conversation. And, and that's, why, that's why I'm very skeptical, um, in fact, opposed to, uh, to pseudo-scientific or, or half-scientific statement that you can find on the internet. Because you, you cannot have a, there's no gray area. If you talk about science, either you know what you're talking about, or you, 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 it's, it's better if you didn't talk at all in, in the first place. Uh, so if you are investigating this specific area of neuroscience, then you want to make sure to have proper a proper understanding of the research, because otherwise, just an overall superficial knowledge might actually give you the false impression, and in the worst case, the opposite impression of what the science actually says. So what are these areas in the brain? Well, starting from the cortex, the cortex is very different in female and um, male subjects. Again, in all these areas, there is a variation. Of course, there is a variation, but this variation, yet again, still belongs biologically and neurologically to the binary presentation. So the cortex is very different. The way the, way the brain is wired is very different. Uh, think about uh, the corpus callosum, for instance, separating the left from the right hemisphere, and how, uh, in general, and by general, I do mean scientifically speaking, the vast majority, scientifically speaking, of female subjects have a connectivity that's much more holistic, I dare to say, contralateral from the right to the left hemisphere, and vice versa, in comparison to the male counterpart, which is front to back. Now, even if you were not a scientist, some, I would say, Pop scientific appreciation for this will actually give you a pretty big hint. What does that mean? Well, for instance, studies, um, multiple studies, multiple meta-analysis, multiple systematic review, yield the same exact result over decades. The fact that on average, women in general tend to be much better at things connected to verbal comprehension and verbal communication. They are much better at visualizing connectivity between faces and community-based interaction in comparison to the male counterpart. The male counterpart tends to be better in visual spatial perception, in mathematical analysis, when this is related to understanding uh, the surroundings, for, instance, for, for, uh, for example, reading maps. Does that mean that a woman cannot become a an engineer, for instance, or that a man cannot become a uh, teacher? Absolutely not. Yet again, this clear sexually dimorphic presentation in human beings does not contain any hierarchical value of judgment, none whatsoever. In fact, we could also argue that claiming otherwise is really sexist. So to claim that there is a unisex ability is actually a detrimental statement to both genders. To claim that a person is only valuable in society if this person performs well in engineering, in mathematics, means that at first we might give the false impression that we are inclusive, that we want to value women in science and research, as we should. The truth, however, is that this would mean that other areas, which are also very important, 
in fact, I would say, even from an evolutionary perspective, fundamental are as valuable. In other words, if a stereotypical behavior, and by stereotypical, yet again, I use a scientific terminology here. A stereotypical woman wants to become a, I don't know, a elementary school teacher. This is just as valuable as a male designed to become a chemical engineer. Exactly the same value. Because in a society where we have to be tolerant, thank God for, for the, our ability to notice when things are not as tolerant, we should allow all human beings to become what they are best equipped for. Now, there is variation in this binary distribution. We mentioned that. So we will find male subjects that are better than the average in the context of mutual communication, uh, proper um, empathetic transmission, and therefore they will be very, very well equipped to become kindergarten teachers, for instance, or gym instructors, or, or elementary middle school teachers. By the same token, we will find female subjects that are fantastic, phenomenal biologists. In fact, if we want to be very precise here, um, the gender binary has been with us forever and it's here to stay. And this is also a claim in terms of the uh, human sex binary that was actually defended by a Nobel Prize biologist in Germany. And so this is where the conversation is quite humorous in my mind, because the very areas that claim to be tolerant and inclusive are really rejecting what actually science says, especially, which is even more concerning, if this is not just a random scientist, it's a Nobel Prize scientist, a Nobel Prize awarded in a time where the Nobel Prize, in my mind, was still uh, scientifically based. I cannot make the claim the last few years, unfortunately. And not just that, but a woman scientist, a phenomenal scientist. So to claim that uh, the sex binary is a indication of hierarchical um, uh, value is false and easily disproven by science. Even in terms of overall um, size, overall, we could make the claim that size does not affect cognitive abilities whatsoever. So there is no hierarchy in terms of cognitive abilities between males and female subjects. There are differences. I mentioned only a few things, but the truth is that you can find that throughout, throughout uh, neurological structure. So you have the, 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 the sexually dimorphic nucleus, the NAAH3. You have the hippocampus that's very dimorphic, the amygdala, which is extremely important because in that area specifically, all, all areas that have to do with and flight response mechanism, so we should also take into account the pituitary gland and the, and the secretion of cortisol, all these areas are falsely interpreted by some as an indication that the disorder is a new version of possibilities, while in turn, the opposite is true. It's a problem. Let me, let me uh, clarify this. So we already mentioned the fact that on statistical averages, if you go from chromosome, through gonads, through hormones, through genitalia, through neurotransmitter, neuroanatomy, we still are talking about a very clear sex binary. Now, you might have noticed that I mix and match sex binary with gender binary. And before you think that I'm uh, missing the point here, let's focus on some diagnostic framework here. So um, in the field of clinical psychology or psychiatry, we have a few diagnostic terms that we utilize to um, help individuals uh, learn about themselves and deal in a more nurturing way uh, with the challenges their, that their current uh, situation uh, um, is, is presenting with. So one of the most common terms in diagnostic is gender dysphoria, previously gender uh, identity disorder. And, um, and let's start from a very basic understanding of that, because we're talking about gender at this point. Uh, let, me, let me analyze the, uh, the diagnostic framework first, and then we'll delve into the etymology of it. So 
by general dysphoria, we could simply mean that dysphoria is really on the opposite elements, on the opposite side of the spectrum, uh, than euphoria. Etymology speaking, this is one of the ways we use um, 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 Greek, uh, like a Greek prefix in science. And it's not surprising, DYS as th this, this element of, of evil, or of uh, um, bothersome, of problematic, of not pleasant, of a dissatisfying element, DYS. Euphoria is the opposite, feeling actually satisfied, feeling connected, feeling integrated. Okay. So dysphoria is the opposite than euphoria, but of course, the way we use euphoria, it's not necessarily understood clinically speaking the same way as dysphoria. So um, another another way to interpret this is that since DYS, this, this in Greek, is this evil, this 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 dissatisfying element, it's dissatisfaction, as opposed to EU, EU, like in Europe, right? As full satisfaction, what does it mean, phoria? What, 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 what are we talking about here? Well, phoria, fora, fore, in fero, it's related to the Latin equivalent, F-E-R-O, fero, to the fero, for the ones that are familiar with um, 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 Romance or Italian linguistics, is the same term that you can find in the English equivalent, of course, due to the um, changes in, in um, uh, uh, consonantic sound, think of the uh, Lautverschiebung, for the ones of you interested in linguistics, and uh, Brother Grimm. So, ferro, it's to bear, as in bear in mind, or supportare in Latin or Italian, bearing the weight. It's the same etymology you can find, by the way, in Christopher, the Christ bearer, or Lucifer, the light bearer, okay? To bear something to bear dissatisfaction. So something that is crushing you under its weight and does not make you live a life fully. So it is a disorder. People affected by gender dysphoria are overall not performing as well in areas of being content or happy or just functional in comparison to the average population. So why call it dysphoria versus gender identity dis disorder? Um, now, this is a discussion that should be um, at the level of, I would say, critical understanding, not necessarily criticism, uh, and comparative analysis between the ICD, the inter uh, International Classification of, of Diseases, as opposed to the, the book that we use in the United States, which is the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which, of course, is a United-based manual published by the American Psychiatry Association and uh, it's a manual that should not be intended, uh, because it doesn't, uh, as a manual of etiological, biological, uh, um, or, or, um, or um, uh, causal factor manual, but simply what the name implies, diagnostic, so we use the, rep, the, the proper terms to identify something so that we all agree on the fact that we're talking about the same thing. And statistical, because we're talking about uh, the percentage, the incidence, the ratio. Now, uh, whether we're talking about gender dysphoria or gender identity uh, disorder, we're still talking about the same thing. So the fact that the person has to, um, to uh, have a presentation with a specific uh, time and intensity, with specific um, traits for at least six months, and this is not uncommon in in um, clinical psychology or psychiatric diagnosis, we have to figure out, uh, statistically speaking, a time frame, and we need to monitor the intensity. Um, so we have to have two or more of those traits, a very strong desire or conviction or, or, or a significant um, incongruence with the body that you are, you could use the term, uh, be feeling prisoner of and your identity. Okay? So there's a clash between the way you feel and the way your body is. Now, we also need to clarify because another criticism that uh, I heard many times from, from the right uh, political spectrum is that, well, facts do not care about your feelings. Well, we don't have to pick and choose because for every feeling, we do have a biological, more specifically, either an endocrinological uh, or um, neurological underpinning. So we're, we're, we're not talking about two different things. When we talk about feelings, we're still talking about 
things that are real. They're real because they act on our bodies, okay? I would not make the claim that some reductionist materialists make that uh, our feelings are our uh, hormones or our neurotransmitter, the same way as I would never make the claim because there's no scientific evidence for it whatsoever that um, the brain is the same thing as our soul, for instance, or even our mind, if you don't want to take into account the more uh, metaphysical components. And if, if you hear these this, uh, uh, claims, well, you, you might want to read more about the research because those claims, um, at the very least, can be, uh, can be misrepresented or they should be um, suspended in the absence of solid data. In fact, this is not what science investigates to begin with because the scientific method, by very definition, has to be predicated upon something that is observable. In any case, um, there is a, mis a missing link between the way we feel and the way we are, physically speaking. This is also another assumption, the fact that our body is us, okay? Which, again, might be a problematic um, element to consider, especially if uh, there are parts of us that we like and parts of us that we don't like. I want to make an example here. Uh, classical example, um, if, uh, if one were to claim that you are only your body, and you should do anything to your body. You are the person you're born with in terms of the way your body at birth. And any change is indicative of a mental health disorder or even worse, a moral or ethical disorder. This is absolutely not true because just think about uh, I don't know, getting a haircut. This is contrary to the way we were born. If you did not cut your hair, your hair will keep growing. Well, you reach my age and then my stop growing. But in any case, this is already making a, an external aesthetic change for our body. So any claim to say, well, you better accept, the, accept yourself the way you are because you cannot make any changes about your body or the way you are in this world, well, it's, it's a false claim. Uh, even taking a shower, it's making a change because naturally speaking, the body will, will, uh, will have different processes to either detoxify or the opposite to getting sick as a result of poor hygiene. So any, or, or cutting one's nails, for instance, or brushing one's teeth, or even putting clothing on, we do make changes to our bodies. There are changes, of course, that are more um, intense or permanent. Think about changing in hair color, for instance. It doesn't have to be indicative of any psychological problem whatsoever. It's just an aesthetic preference. Uh, things as tattoos, for instance, while permanent, they also don't that are not indicative of any problem whatsoever. Now, of course, I'm moving away from any judgment on, um, on anthropological or historical component where there are indeed societies and um, or ethno-religious, ethno-cultural groups uh, where uh, tattoos either take on a very spiritual, metaphysical, esoteric notion or ritualistic notion or the opposite. They're, they're frowned upon because they are um, constitutive of a, a immoral stance to our life. But this is not the focus of, of this discussion. What I'm trying to say here is that the claim that you should just accept yourself as who you are without doing anything to your body, it's a false claim, which is easily uh, disproven by science and also by uh, well-grounded uh, common sense, which, of course, is not that common. Um, but at the same time, if we move from dysphoria to gender identity disorder, we will move to a different understanding of what we're actually dealing with. And this will also take on a very, very um, different route in our investigation because uh, we have to think of, okay, if this is something that science can diagnose, uh, and it does, um, we, we should make a claim that we should find it somewhere. And it, it, just because the DSM does not talk about the um, etiological mechanism uh, of, of diseases, we still need to find where those things are rooted. We can always make the claim, the same thing as we cannot say that this is the primary cause of, let's say, schizophrenia or depression, but we have a pretty good understanding of all the things that actually contribute to that presentation, where they are, what they do, for how long, and what prevents them from acting in an abnormal way. So in the context of a GID, we can think of uh, many, many areas. Um, I would say probably the bad nucleus of the uh, terminality is, is the most relevant uh, or among the most relevant in the scientific uh, literature, 
But of course, this is still connected with, this, uh, with, with the amygdala and the cortisol because the, 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 this area still uh, um, still modulates uh, prenatal androgen, sorry, it still modulates sex and anxiety and it's connected to uh, prenatal uh, androgen um, and, and exposure, of course, um, to, uh, to uh, th these hormones. So, okay, we can, we can make the claim that there is something that is indicative of the presence of gender identity disorder. So anybody who claims that this is just a question of a temporary feeling, well, yes, and what you're trying to demonstrate here. Everything is a question of modulation across the spectrum, across the spectrum, as in across the endocrine system, the nervous system, et cetera, et cetera, all the systems. So everything's connected. Uh, but if that was the case, it was only a question of bodiness, okay, or otherness. And I think of from a philosophical standpoint, you think about the otherness from me. Uh, think about Levinas, for instance, Michael Levinas, a philosopher. Then this will make uh, dysphoria exactly the same thing as dysmorphia or body dysmorphic disorders. Which is kind of interesting because uh, the idea, uh, it's, not, it's not an idea, it's not just a, a question of, 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 of uh, personal interpretation, it's a question of properly interpreting data, is that there is an element of anxiety, of phobia associated to it. And so while dysmorphia, the, the, the concept itself, it's, it's this inappreciation, you could say, or partial appreciation, or partial problem with the form okay think about uh, phonetics and etymology form more forma morphine in greek latin and greek so this morph is something wrong something bad something dissatisfying with the shape of our body okay and this is connected to body dysmorphic disorder as well as not surprising to um uh social anxiety disorder to eating disorders and to a variety of uh uh, problems uh, within mood and personality disorders, uh, uh, as well as um, problems that that are um, related to uh, overall self-esteem, depression, cluster B traits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a, a improper appreciation for one's body, yeah? uh, which which is uh, unhealthy but easily categorized in comparison to gender identity disorder because we're talking about one's body. Now, when we talk about gender identity disorder, however, we have these two terms that we still need to qualify a little better. So we talked about disorder before. We need to talk about identity and we need to talk about gender. Now, when we think about identity, identity is predicated upon the notion that something can be identical to oneself. Identical, okay? Identitas, okay? In, in Latin. And this is one of the most important notions in any psychological uh, therapeutic methodology. I would say certainly within um, within cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, as well as polypsychology, as well as psychodynamic psychology, uh, psychodynamic psychotherapy, uh, even some level of um, analysis. Maybe not Freudian psychoanalysis necessarily, because um, we can leave that for a different discussion. But um, a lot of those claims are really not, not scientific anymore, but I would say more on the level of Jungian analysis to some extent, this reintegration of the self, okay, completion, reintegration as in re-identification with oneself, um, whereby if I'm not identifying as myself, I am shattered, okay, or even um, some form of, of um, psychiatric slash psychological interpretation as the one offered by Rudolf Allers, for instance. This is very important because if I'm not integrated within myself, I am disintegrated. Um, an analysis that I make all the time is to think of um, having um, a metaphoric representation of our identity. So let's imagine we have a piece of paper, a sheet of paper right here in front of us, and this and the sheet of paper is intact. And then things happen in life, and... Uh, something breaks them apart, okay? Break, breaks, breaks two sides of the of the uh, piece of paper apart. So there's a little bit of a, a dent there, you know, relatively small um, dent in, in the piece of paper. Nevertheless, these traumatic events makes our conceptualization of self partially 
unfulfilled. It's not full, it's not complete. Okay. Keep in mind the etymological connection between wholeness and holiness. You're whole if you're whole, if you're complete. Okay. If nothing happens in life, this overall minor traumatic experience will be just that. It will be a scar that might even define who you are, but will not define who you are as the only thing about yourself. And that's when I'm very, very critical of a certain element of uh, reverse victimism that I found sometimes in pseudo-sociological appreciation for psychotherapy. What do I mean by pseudo-victimism? The idea that everybody is a survivor. Now, if the, if the alternative is self-destruction, as in a, a, such low level of self-esteem that will push a person to possibly self-harm or even suicide. Now, by no means, we should reject the idea of being a trauma survivor. Trauma survivor, the term, should be welcome in those extreme cases. One of the issues, however, is that once you start to identify yourself with a survivor, that piece of the small piece of trauma becomes your primary way to identify yourself. Everything else about you becomes that. This is true for most of the uh, diagnostic framework we use. Any label should be utilized as a label. First, to understand what, we, what we're talking about, so that in the scientific community, we are identifying the same problem, so we don't have personal interpretation or, or bias, special confirmation bias, but also because we need to start from something to decide scientifically speaking, not because of our personal preference, uh, on what um, biomechanical or um, biochemical in the context of pharmacology intervention we should apply to that specific issue. Otherwise, labels tend to really drag us down. They're limiting the very spectrum you were trying to promote here. So identifying oneself as anything but myself, that could be an issue. The opposite issue, of course, is fully identify just with myself and reject any type of group understanding, rejecting family as a nucleus, rejecting community, rejecting uh, society. So both are extremes. In any case, uh, if the trauma is relatively small, there's just a you know, small dent in the, you know, in the piece of, uh, of paper that we have in our hands. Life could happen and this dent become bigger and bigger to the point that the, the piece of paper is divided in two halves. And at this point, we could make the case, uh, both neurologically speaking, as well as diagnostically, that a person is experiencing a disembodied identity, a dissociated identity, a separated, a no longer integrated, therefore disintegrated identity. I no longer recognize myself as myself, but have a multiple self. Now, careful, because this is used by some to make the claim that we are only one thing and one thing only. There is no room for any differentiation of our presentation or even behavior. Now, this is, of course, not true. Uh, we can just think about everyday circumstances where your very demeanor and even your jargon, the words you use, might differ whether you are uh, in, uh, in the context of a public academic lecture or spending time in a bar with your friends as you should. This does not necessarily mean that you are either lying to yourself or that your identity is disintegrated. It simply means that you have the ability to uh, to monitor social cues that tells you that saying that word in that context might not be proper or the opposite, saying uh, another word in a different context might be actually justified. In any case, though, uh, you could say that from a diagnostic standpoint, you have three, three main areas or, or, or even four areas. You start from a these and this um dissatisfaction or partial satisfaction with one area of your life and this at this level is just simply a question of preference it, there's nothing pathological about being unhappy with one's look for instance i don't know you just woke up in the morning you didn't sleep at night or you know you have kids like like myself and and <laughs> your night was not that nurturing and you look at yourself in the mirror and you're horrified. Oh, well, I, I didn't realize I was that old. There's nothing pathological in that. Uh, the same way as there's nothing pathological in wanting to change yourself, um, putting some nice clothes on, change your hairdo. Again, the example I made to mention earlier, some piercing, some tattoos, you can do that. However, if you feel there is something intrinsically wrong about yourself that is following you like a, um, like a scarlet letter everywhere you go, you might be starting to become 
obsessive about it or even phobic about the element, which again, it's very similar to the neurological presentation that we find in uh, body dysmorphic disorder. And it's modulated by the same neural um, neural mechanism. And so you, the likelihood that you're obsessed about that specific part of your body, I don't know, you have too big of a nose, you don't like your ears, you don't like your teeth, that you, you might become more and more consumed with that. And then you're moving from a partial dissatisfaction to a cognitive distortion. Okay? We talk about cognitive distortion all the time or automatic negative thoughts, intrusive thoughts in cognitive behavioral therapy. And from there, you can have a partial uh, improper, partial uh, dissatisfaction with yourself. But if you continue, not because you want to do this, I want to clarify, this is not something about you should stop doing that. It's about understanding why this is happening in the first place. This could lead to a variety of things that, that could lead the person to go to uh, uh, paranoid uh, ideation, to persecutory traits, all the way to full dissociative features where the person no longer recognizes themselves as themselves, but their multiple selves, the old multiple personality disorders, which we could really interpret as trauma-induced. In this context, we also need to understand the role of trauma because the idea is this. First of all, let me be very clear here. If a person comes to me, a patient comes to me, and the person claims to uh, have suffered a trauma, whatever nature, psychological, emotional, sexual, behavioral, physical, the proper way to go about this is to fully believe the person. There are things that we can simply not monitor using the scientific method. We need to trust the person in front of us. However, this trust is still predicated upon our scientific knowledge, our scientific understanding, our exegetic understanding, our interpretation-based understanding. Why is it the case? Well, because any type of trauma, I'd say, even if the trauma itself did not occur in the way the person representing, is representing it to have occurred, it's nevertheless leaving a mark in the person, okay? So we should give the person the benefit of the doubt. So in any case, um, without delving into the etymology of trauma, I did this elsewhere, and I can link some, some resources um, uh, in the video, in all these situations, there is an element of a problematic um, interruption or variation as in taking a different route in comparison to the norm. Does that mean that people affected by either gender identity disorder or body dysmorphia are people that should be valued, again, in a hierarchical judgment as less morally, behaviorally, socially, whatever you want to use, the, whatever um, adjective you want to use or adverb you want to use, inferior than others? Absolutely not. But it is our ethical uh, role as scientists, as clinicians, as people in general, as parents, to make sure that the person understands that this is not healthy for them. It's an interruption of the normal occurring process that would yield satisfaction as opposed to dissatisfaction. Now, you might argue, okay, well, but I didn't cause this. Because another false claim that I heard, that I heard uh, many times, well, it's just a question of preference. And this is really important because uh, I'm really opposed to putting everything in the same basket, at, uh, even within the, 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 um, the acronym LGBTQIA+, etc., because we're talking about completely different things. The idea of tolerance and inclusion should be defended at all costs, of course. Um, all the individuals that will identify with any of these letters should receive our full understanding, our full love, our full appreciation. And yet again, you will not put everything in the same basket in any other field of science, even more specifically, any other field of medicine, you will not put people suffering from gastrointestinal disorder in exactly the same um, realm of people suffering from, I don't know, fibromyalgia, for instance. Of course, you might draw some parallel and some, some etiological similarities between things, but it will not be a proper way to conduct oneself as a scientist if you confound two different medical presentations. You will do a disservice to the person. 
Okay, so what, what has the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases, um, have to say about uh, gender identity disorders? Since we're still talking about identity, these, these need to be fully identified with oneself. Okay? Well, there are different terms you can find. The ICD, transsexualism, uh, gender identity disorder unspecified, other or children slash adult uh, gender identity disorder. We also have a relatively new rapid onset, which is very controversial and in, in and I would say it's not controversial at all in the science in, in solid science, uh, uh, unless you ignore all the science has to say, especially in the field of um, evolutionary biology and um, human growth and development for the last hundred years. If you ignore that, that you find my you might find a rapid onset GD as more of a um, completely separate entity, but otherwise you, you better study a little more. Or you have a sexual maturation disorder. Notice the difference here. Okay. The idea here is there is a separation between identity and permanence. Okay. So the permanence of self is an area within. Uh, not just psychology and medicine, but also within neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, I would say specifically, and even more so within embodied cognition that is essential for a proper development in the person. If the person cannot recognize themselves as themselves, a variety of issues will arise in the context of either early rapid onset or late uh, presentation of the disorder. Um, even basic psychology will yield the same result. Think about the studies of um, uh, Jean Piaget, for instance, uh, regarding you know, object permanence. Okay? The assumption, which is entirely based on science and is completely separate from um, uh, social constructs, um, um, education level, background, it's rooted in biology is the fact that the child eventually learns to identify himself or herself progressively as a separate entity, therefore a new identity from the child, usually the mother. Yeah? And rightfully so, as we grow up, we become ourselves. But as we become ourselves, things can also happen, usually, and again, I'm talking statistical terms here, associated with traumatic experiences that might compromise the natural occurring process. And that's why we're talking about sexual maturation disorder from biological standpoint, chromosome gonads, chromosome genitalia, and neural functions. Or we're talking about transsexualism. All right, so we talked about identity a little bit. There's much more to say about that, but I want to be mindful of the time. All right, what about the first term? You just mentioned transsexualism. Are you making, I'm imagining someone telling me this. Are you making the assumption that transsexualism and transgenderism are the same thing? Why would you put the ISM in at the end to begin with? Well, aside from the term itself and um, and the, the 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 suffix ISM could take a variety of meanings, some of which can be positive, some of which can be negative. Think about the difference between um, um, hedonisms or, or, or communism or socialism, the isms. Okay, uh, but let's talk about the difference between sexuality or rather sex and gender now there's a variety of um of opinion in this matter uh i would say uh a variety of these opinion simply break it upon um, ignorance uh not knowing enough not studying enough and few of these opinion that are there really cease to be opinion that are indeed science-based now, uh, you might wonder, well, this is too much of a um, stretch to go from biology to etymology or to linguistics or to sociology, really. To claim that sex and gender are is the same thing is a misrepresentation of what science has to say and what culture has to say. Unless science clearly disproves that. Now, of course, in the context of um, science, we tend to use sex and sexuality much more commonly as a representation of sexual function, of sexual performance or lack thereof in a hierarchical level, uh, uh, in the context of, um, of fertility or infertility, in the context of um, gonadal uh, discussion, in the context of evolutionary biology, in the context of human growth and development. The term sex itself, as, as we will see later, is in, in, its, in, in itself really a separation, really a binary separation, and it's connected to the etymology of to cut, to separate. 
okay? and, and many others. But from the perspective of European linguistics, if you really want to go back to the core, to the core as, as far back as we can go, then we need to understand that this is the truth of sex. It, it's the separation, it's the distinction. So um, does this mean that this is a discrimination? Well, in etymological sense, yes, you should be able to discriminate, to separate, to divide female from male. From Not from a religious standpoint, not from a philosophical standpoint, but for a purely biological one, because otherwise you will not produce offspring. So this is innate. We can talk more about, about, about sex uh, and the fact that the term itself is going to scissors, for instance, or um, or uh, even uh, C-section, which has nothing to do with with uh, Caesar, uh, as many as many uh, would think, Caesar as the Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor, uh, but it has to do with to cut, okay, Caesar. And and um, in terms of other etymology within the Indo-European spectrum, you can think of of hexes or, or ticto, so uh, divine procreating. Uh, or even having having a specific state, uh, the state of being uh, pregnant, for instance, okay, a stato di gravidanza in Italian, okay. So this is sex. So uh, can can we argue that sex indicates biological sex? Well, if bio if by biology we mean everything we said in the last hour and a half, yes, sex indicates biology, and it is binary. 